I'm Mark Armini. It's been a long time since I uploaded a video about Gene Wolfe, but I thought maybe this time I should do something different. Maybe two years ago I actually recorded one on Wizard, Wizard Night, and I never actually uploaded it, right? I was like, well, it seems a little bit random. But you know, the proliferation of podcasts about Wolfe had me thinking, people actually enjoy the slower pace, right, of these chapter by chapter breakdowns where it's not just overwhelming here's the main idea the issue with me doing something like that though is how often I really do feel that Wolf's works are extremely unified that there's a main idea that can be summed up in a few words right instead of questioning 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 something that answers those small details something that really ties it together and this is especially prevalent in his work after Wizard Knight, right? I think all those late works are easily tied together once you figure them out, right? That there's something that unifies in them. I've noticed that a lot of people that I speak with seem persuaded, and sometimes the people who read my write-ups, right, probably because they're long or maybe because of the organization, they say, I didn't find this particularly persuasive. But one of the things that I really want to talk about is that I think early in his career, Wolf tended to write with mysteries that could be answered but they weren't complete palimpsests that overturned the entire text. Like, the Book of the New Sun actually happens. There's a character named Severian, right? Um, one of Robert Borsky's readings of Q's, right, was, was really where you saw him approaching it as if the text were a palimpsest of something else. In that case, this alien bowling ball from Deneb or whatever making a deal so that this guy forever loses his sense of humor, that there'll be nothing, or excuse me, Everything will be funny to him, I think, right? He'll have this weird sense of humor uh, where nothing can be taken seriously. Uh, I need to review that. But, um, you know, that's a surface text. And Borsky kind of presents the idea, right, that it's actually about a man going to the toilet or something like that. And I don't think that's Wolf's intention at all. But I do think that Wolf looked at some of the things that people had read into his work and said, you know what, I can do something like that. Um, he did do... Uh, you know, in Peritonitis, a, a, a fable almost of a, a small event taking place inside a human being where the characters were like germs and things like that. And so Wizard Knight is part of that palimpsestic tradition where there's a surface story, there's something underneath it, right, that explains a lot of the other things, even though there's still meaningful things to draw if you never get there. And so if I actually do a chapter-by-chapter -chapter breakdown of Wizard Knight, which I'm planning to do right now, you'll see that I will push a certain reading aggressively, right? And this might be off-putting to some listeners who necessarily aren't persuaded by it. But one of the things that I hope to establish is that the particular reading that I have in mind will actually allow us to predict what's going to happen with very high accuracy, right? We can stop and we can say, oh my gosh, they're going to fight over food here, or they're going to be chained together and face dissent, right? Because we know the overarching theme there. So there's just a little bit of setup I need for the Wizard Knight here. Ostensibly, it's a portal fantasy, right? In which I'm going to, I and this is a maximum spoiler podcast. So if you haven't read the book and you don't want to know anything about it, stop right here, okay? Don't go further if you are sensitive to spoilers at all. I read and read and read these books until I get the whole sense in my head. So I'll be talking about the last page when we're reading the first page. So just, you know, a warning there, right? This is maximum spoiler, but I also push a particular agenda. Now, one of the things I want to do is respond to people, but you won't find me often questioning a lot of my assertions. And I'm likely to be unbendable, right? Like once I understand why something happens, I tend not to backtrack. It's not confirmation bias. I've looked at the totality of the text and I've seen the patterns there and they seem to be extremely rigid. Do I believe that it jives with Wolf's intention? Yes, I do, right? And that's probably why talking with me about something sometimes isn't that fun, right? Because I'm like, I see what he's doing here. We're going to explore it from that. But I still want the audience to engage with me, to ask questions, because we don't have to go to that lowest level, right, of what really happened in the text here every single time. We can talk about other thematic resonances as well. It's not as if this is the answer to everything in the text. It just answers the structural mysteries and puts in order those small details that otherwise people just ignore. So real quickly, Wizard Knight, a portal fantasy in which Arthur Ornsby, uh, in this world that he's coming to known as Abel, goes 
through somehow. He winds up in Celadon, right, in Arthur's um, kingdom there. And it is kind of paralleled with some of the Norse structures of like the divine, right, where you have, you know, the, the Aesir and the Veneer living in different levels, and then you've got Setter, Searcher down below there, uh, Muspelheim and Niflheim. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. But first off, I want to start with the basic premise, right, that he is a lost child from the very beginning he's a lost child and he will somehow quicken immediately to adulthood but there is a different reading that i'm going to be bringing to that moment when he finds his ideal desiree right when he finds that desire there and he kind of blossoms into a full-grown man instantly and then he can't find her he's looking for her for the rest of the time there's going to be uh, subtextual explanations for a lot that happens and um, one of the things that we're going to bring into it is Jung, right, Carl Jung, uh, because one of the arguments that I'm going to make is that there is a reality and that there are dreams that are occurring, but that what we actually have in this is something like a dream. It's the letter that he's writing, but the letter in the final analysis is actually what Michael has found a way to deliver to his brother and his mother, right? Um, so we're going we're gonna to open with um, his little poem that he starts with, right? And I'm probably going to use the tour editions after today, um, but we're going to look at that poem by Lord Dunsany, right? The Riders. So I'm just going to talk about this very quickly. Who treads those level lands of gold, the level fields of mist and air, and rolling mountains manifold, and towers of twilight over there? No mortal foot upon them strays, no archer in the tower dwells, but feet too airy for our ways go up and down their hills and dells. So here we have this kind of mythical romantic landscape, but it's important to note no mortal foot upon them strays, right? There's something either immortal and godlike or the sense that these are, these are no longer mortal beings that we're running into there. Are they the things of myth and legend? Well, Yes, but this also is going to apply to what we're dealing with in the Wizard Knight here. The people out of old romance, and people that have never been, and those that on the border dance between old history and between resounding fable, as the king who held his court at Camelot. There Guinevere is wandering, and there the knight Sir Lancelot, and by yon precipice of white, as steep as Roncesvalles and more, within an inch of fancy sight, Rolling the peerless rides to war, and just the tip of Coyote's spear, the greatest of them all by far, is surely visible from here, but no, it is the evening star. Now, Don Quixote is someone who idealizes the world around him and has all these fantasies and visions, right? But I want to go back to that one line, the people out of old romance and people that have never been, because this is going to be the primary argument that I'm carrying into the text here, that actually the letter that is delivered is the dream Michael sends to Arthur, Arthur Ornsby's mother, right, that she had a child that was never born. He never actually was. And how does this work? We're going to contextualize this a lot, but it's a Jungian dream in which certain patterns are repeated. And so, for example, um, when Abel and the captain fight, the captain is going to get a head injury. He's going to be killed that way. The next C character that we run into continues the narrative as kind of like it resets, right? The Chamberlain, when he meets him, has a scar on his head. Why? Because it's the same, right? The same kind of character as the captain who he fought for a berth on the ship. Well, the Chamberlain is going to be smashed by uh, King Gilling, right? And so there's a pattern, but it slowly progresses. The, the narrative shifts. So when Osser, the child of uh, Desiree and uh, some bandit, right, is kind of abandoned and the mother is killed, he's given to the Bodicon, I believe. And you see a sense that where did he go? He never comes up again. But he does in Org, the other O character. So these narratives flow through, but they're a part of a cyclical dream in which we get insemination, dropping off, uh, reabsorption, and death ultimately, though not final death, right? And this pattern will be repeated, and we're going to point to it uh, quite a bit as we go on here. But this is ostensibly, right, a letter that Abel is writing years later. So I'm just going to look at the opening and then the opening paragraph of the first chapter, and we'll stop there today. Ben, 
Look at this first. I've been reading through the first part of this letter. There are an awful lot of names you will not know. So I've listed most of them here. If you come across one and wonder who that is or where it is, you can look here. You'd be wasting your time to read this now. It's just to look the names up in. The nice thing about this alphabetical list here is you have, you know, A, B, C. So you can see um, how many G names there are, right? Gainer, Gerda, Jerry, right? The girl you were dating when I lost America, for example. And how those, um, you know, the other G, G Gerda there, the girl Bo Berthold was going to marry. How there seems to be like B is connected to G, right, in a certain way. So we'll talk about these patterns more explicitly later. But one of the things that I'm going to pull in is the idea of Jungian archetypes, right? And so Gilf, this, this, this dog that Abel has, even though there's going to be more dogs, you know, he stands for something. And he is kind of like the Jungian shadow there uh, that serves a protective purpose that's beyond conscious control. And so we're going we're gonna to talk about all that, but we'll also talk about the surface plot as well. So let me go to the opening, chapter one. Dear Ben, you must have stopped wondering what happened to me a long time ago. I know it's been many years. I have the time to write here. What looks like a good chance to get what I write to where you are. So I'm going to try. If I just told everything on a couple of sheets, you would not believe most of it. Hardly any of it. Because there are many things that I have trouble with myself. Of course, as all wolf narrators does, right? He, he doesn't have the full context of the situation. So what I'm going to do instead is tell everything. When I finished, you still may not believe me, but you will know all that I do. In some ways, that is a lot. In others, practically nothing. When I saw you sitting by our fire, my own brother there on the battlefield, never mind. I'll get to it. Only I think it may be why I'm writing now. So we're just going to look at that first paragraph here, which leads to the end of the book when Abel has received a helm of truth seeing on seven mules in, uh, I think, Red Hall, right, when he inherits Red Hall. Earlier in the book, Gilling got a helm on seven mules as well, part of that cyclical pattern that's repeated there throughout. But when he sees through it, right, he sees that Desiree is kind of just a thing of mud and sticks there. And he sees when he looks at Bold Berthold, Abel's brother in Celadon, when he gets there, he sees Ben. How is Bold Ben, right, on a truer level? And we're going we're gonna to talk about that, right? But one of the things that I insist on is that for me to abandon a reading of a book, people have to explain these details, right? They have to be able to articulate, okay, how is Bold Ben somehow, right? Or, you know, how, how exactly is it that this is going to work? And we're going to contextualize all of that with the main reading. So here's here's the, the palimpsest level, right? Beyond just going to a portal world, we have a metaphor for the hostile environment of the womb where speed is everything, right? The sperm has to get to the egg. And so when Abel grows, right? When Abel grows, when he meets Desiree, he basically has inseminated her. There's like those serpents coiling like muscles under his skin there, right? There's a sense that he instantly grows and then he can't find her anymore at that point. Uh, and so some people are very hostile to this, right? When he shows up there in the cave, Parka, right? You know, she's measuring out the string there. She gives him a cord and she says, plant a seed. And it, the, the cave fills with doves, white doves, right? And I'm going to ask you, as you're reading this, later on you're going to get the giant sperm imagery there, which is upsetting to some people, that you think through a sexual lens when you read every scene. So for example, when um, the sun night, right, comes, and uh, he's talking about piercing the golden con's eye in between two canals, right? I want you to think of that in sexual terms, right? Like, not necessarily uh, in, in a lewd or pornographic way, but be aware of these metaphors there that are occurring and what they mean. When, when Bull drops something of himself or loses something of himself in the pond there, and it's returned to him on the last page, and Abel declares, I'm not able. It means something. So what we're going to do with this, I decided whether I should do a podcast or I should do a video. I really don't like editing anything, right? So you're not going to get fancy effects or music unless I suddenly am inspired to do that. But you are going to get textual analysis where I'll break down a chapter or a couple chapters at a time. I'll try to stay on a regular schedule for this one. But we will see as we go scene by scene 
how rigid the structures and patterns are in this work. There's going to be uh, the surface story, of course, we're going to spend time on that, but I'll also explain why certain things happen in the order that they do, right? I'll explain why a sibling is waving at another sibling from a lower point, or why uns and gilling and uh, tug all have problems speaking or breathing at certain points, and bold too with that thing around his neck there. We're going to talk about these structural patterns that create a very real sense of meaning. And one of the easiest ways to do this is to just recognize that the dreams represent a kind of reality and they're far more unified than they should be. Um, so in a podcast, right, there's a lot of editing. There seems to be discussion. I would welcome a guest, right? But I'm always going to be pushing that narrative reason for things, the things that I understand and don't question. Very rarely will you hear in my voice, why does this happen? I don't know. That's not necessarily uh, my approach to this. And so many readers or listeners may find limited utility if they adamantly disagree with the underlying theme that I'm pushing. So we're still going to talk about the, the surface reading, and we're still going to break it down in that way like the other podcasts are doing. But I think you will find that I'm a little bit more assertive and a little more stubborn. But I would welcome guests to speak with if we can find a way to do that right whether that be in a purely um, verbal episode with no images or anything like that so i am going to go ahead and end right here but hopefully in the next week i'll go through chapter one of wizard night and we'll start a slow protracted read through go ahead and subscribe if you have a chance and if you haven't done so right i do have take a look at my two books on gene wolf on on amazon right between light and shadow and beyond time and memory Third one uh, should be, you know, out there someday. This project grew a lot. Go ahead and subscribe. Review those books if you enjoy them. If you don't enjoy them, review them, right? Uh, I, I noticed that the second volume was published to very little fanfare at all. There doesn't seem to be an Amazon review there. So go ahead. Take the time if you do enjoy or don't enjoy the kind of things that I do with Wolf to, to spend a little time there. I'd appreciate that a lot. So, like I said, we're going to go through this. I'll try and keep to a regular schedule, even though that's not really my pattern. I'm someone who tends to just spew it out when I'm in the mood. Um, but I'm going to try to be more rigid and rigorous about that there. So, a chapter or two every week, and eventually we'll get through Wizard Knight. And then maybe we'll do this for Latro, so that slower protracted treatment that the podcasts are doing with that, you know, Armenian spin of righteous self-certainty uh, that you've come to expect and, and either love or hate from me. Thank you so much for listening today, and uh, I hope that everyone continues to read and enjoy Gene Wolfe, regardless of whether you agree with my readings or any of the readings that you hear there, because really he's an author worthy of being deserved, studied, and enjoyed overall.